We're in such an important and intense time in the gospel of Luke. Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem for his crucifixion. This is going to be his last trip to Jerusalem where he'll be arrested, he'll be crucified, buried, and rise again. As he's traveling to Jerusalem, he stops, passes through Jericho. If you remember from last week, he had a conversation with the rich young ruler who had everything going for him, but was not willing to let go of his money, materialism, to follow Christ. Then Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. He cried out for mercy. Quite a contrast between blind Bartimaeus and the rich young ruler. This flows right into chapter 19, where Jesus now ministers to Zacchaeus, a wee little man. The scripture says he's short in stature, and he climbs a sycamore tree to see Jesus. Verse 1, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. All of this is happening as Jesus is passing through Jericho. He's headed to Jerusalem to be crucified with the cross on his heart and his mind, but he's still thinking about others. He still has this mindset of serving others. He's simply journeying through. There's no intention to stay in Jericho, but he's open to what the Father's doing. Jesus told us that he was about the Father's business, and God has an appointment for himself here in Jericho with Zacchaeus. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. The reason that he was rich is because he's a tax collector. The largest cities in Israel at this time are Capernaum, Jerusalem, and Jericho, and he's the chief tax collector. So he's the chief tax collector in one of the largest cities, and we know historically that tax collectors for the Roman Empire had the freedom to basically rip people off. If, if you owed $500, they could charge you $1,000 and keep $500 for themselves. They could come at you with false accusation. Here, you've done this, and you would have to then pay the money to be freed of that accusation. We know from the text also that Zacchaeus, he's a Hebrew. He's a child of Israel. So he has become a traitor and he's working for the Roman Empire. The Romans are the dictators that are over the Jewish people. So to say that he's an outcast is to say it lightly. No one liked Zacchaeus. Nobody wanted to spend time with Zacchaeus. How do you feel about your taxes? Timely, huh? Tax day was this week, wasn't it? And then put on top of it, corruption inside of the tax system. Are are you going to have the IRS over for lunch, right? So this is Zacchaeus, and he's this prominent tax collector in the city, and he's rich. But he has a curiosity for Christ. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Last night before the Saturday night service, Richie was asking me, hey, what are you teaching on? And I'm like, Zacchaeus. And he's like, Eric, you have very little in common with Zacchaeus. <laughs> like you've never had to climb a tree to see anything in your life, right? Normally I can just look right over people, but Zacchaeus, he's short. He's of short stature and he wants to see Jesus. So he climbs this sycamore tree because Christ is passing by and this large crowd is, is pressing on Christ. Remember, blind Bartimaeus has just been healed and the crowd has witnessed this and people are gathering in this excitement to, about Christ. Christ is at the end of, of his ministry. All of the miracles leading up to this place, Zacchaeus no doubt has heard about Christ and he wants to see Jesus and he's not content to stay back where he can't see Christ. As a chief tax collector, it was a position of dignity. He was a dignified person in the community, not respected, but this is not the normal posture for a tax collector to say, I'm going to climb a tree. But what got him to that place is that he was curious about Jesus. And I think that that is one of the best things that can happen in our lives is to get curious about Christ. Maybe you're examining who Jesus is and is Jesus God? Did he love me? Did he die for me? Allow that curiosity just to erupt. As believers, we don't want to ever get to a place where we lose curiosity about Christ, where he's got our attention. This curiosity is matched with determination. I'm going to climb a tree. 
I'm going to climb a tree because I want to see Jesus. I'm going to get up and go to church on a Sunday morning, a cold Sunday morning in April. I'm going to get up and read my Bible. I'm going to be in fellowship. I'm going to pursue Christ. It's that kind of curiosity and determination that got sick and got Zacchaeus to climb this sycamore tree. In verse four, so he ran ahead, climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I will stay at your house. Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he saw him. He saw Zacchaeus. You would think that Christ, with everything that was on his mind with the crucifixion, would not have even noticed Zacchaeus up in the tree. How many times when we're going from place to place, do we not even see the people around us, but not Jesus? He saw Zacchaeus. Maybe underline that. He saw Zacchaeus. And the amazing thing about Jesus is he sees you. You're not just a number to him. He knows what's going on in your life. He, he knows your thoughts. Psalms 139 talks about the attention that God gives to us. He knows the words that we're going to speak before we say them. He knows when we're arise and we're going to sit. He, he knows everything about us. He sees us. We're seen by God. We're seen by the one who's created us, who loves us the most. And he knows Zacchaeus. There's no prior introduction between Jesus and Zacchaeus. But Jesus knows him and he calls him by name. And Zacchaeus is probably like, how do you know me? How do you know my name? And God knows you. He sees you. He knows you. He calls you by name. He calls us unto himself. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. How many people did not want to spend time with Zacchaeus? He's the outcast. When was the last time Zacchaeus had a, a guest to his home? Remember, still to this day, but especially in the time of Jesus, in the Middle Eastern culture, to have someone into your home is a big deal. It's an expression of relationship. It's an expression of, of oneness and, and friendship. To share a meal in somebody's home, a very big deal. And here Jesus invites himself over. Says so Zacchaeus, I am coming to your house today. Right now, we're going to do this. This is the last one-on-one -on -one interaction that we have with Jesus before he goes to uh, Jerusalem. This is it. And Christ is really making a statement here of what's important to him, and it's to seek and to save the lost. And I love Zacchaeus' response. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus is like, yes, and he has this joyful leap, almost to the point where he had to slow down and really pay attention that he got out of the tree safely. He's just so excited. He's, he's stoked out of his mind that Jesus would want to come to his house. We think of the rejection that Zacchaeus has received as an outcast, as a tax collector, but Christ also experienced rejection. How many people would not be excited that Jesus was coming to their house? I can guarantee you the Pharisees would have not had this same reaction if Jesus said, I'm coming to your house today. They hated Christ. They didn't want anything to do with Christ. But here's this sinner. Here's this tax collector. Here's this outcast. And he is geeked out of his mind that Jesus is coming to his house. In verse 7 but when they saw it, they complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. This word complained is grumbled. This was the response of the crowd. This is the response of the religious leaders is, I can't believe that Jesus has gone to be a guest of a sinner. It's kind of how we're feeling about the cold weather in April, isn't it? I was doing some work on my sprinkler system Friday, and I was like, I'm going to finish it up on Saturday. Nope, it snowed on Saturday, right? Grumble, grumble, complain, complain. We're like in the fourth winter. <laughs> but they're criticizing Jesus because Jesus is spending time with sinners. And aren't you so thankful that Jesus spends time with sinners? That he spends time with outcasts? 
that Zacchaeus didn't have to have his act together before Jesus would come and spend time with him. In John chapter one, the disciple John says, Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. And the order is really important. He came in grace first. Grace is giving love, unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. And Jesus approached people first with grace. He approaches us with grace. He went to the cross for our sins. Jesus embodies truth. He is truth. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. But it's the grace of God that opens up our hearts to the truth of God. And this is our Savior. This is our God who doesn't shun sinners and shun outcasts. He loves us enough to spend time with us to win our hearts to Jesus that we would understand his love. And verse 8, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. There's transformation, there's change that happens in Zacchaeus' life simply as he spends time with Jesus. As he's in the presence of of the living God who loves him, who knows him, who sees him, who cares for him. He's like, okay, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've robbed anybody through false accusation, I'm going to restore it fourfold. Let's think back to just a few moments prior in the life of Jesus, the rich young ruler, where he was unwilling to lay down his, his goods, his money, And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to get saved. And the disciples are like, who can be saved? What was Christ's response? Hey, with what is impossible with men is possible with God. With God, nothing is impossible. And now, just a few moments later, we see a rich man coming to know Christ their Savior. We see the camel going through the eye of the needle, if if you would. And the words that Jesus responds to Zacchaeus with in verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Today salvation has come. Now Zacchaeus didn't get saved because he gave away half of his possessions to the poor because he made things right with those that he had stole from. He got saved because he trusted Jesus. And giving to the poor and making things right was evidence of his salvation. It's the transformation that took place. It's when grace and the love and faith in Christ entered in his heart and his life. And Jesus acknowledges what's been done in Zacchaeus' life and says, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. It's almost like the other Israelites were like, Zacchaeus doesn't count. Even though he's an Israelite, he doesn't count because he's a traitor working for the Roman Empire. And Jesus says, no, salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. And here we have what I believe to be the theme of the Gospel of Luke, the mission statement of Christ in verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save that what was lost. Even the way that Jesus refers to himself is the son of man. That refers to his humanity. Son of God refers to his deity. Jesus is God, but he's also man. God took on human flesh to seek and to save what was lost. That, that's incredible. That's mind-blowing. The creator of the universe would come in human flesh, be born as a baby in Bethlehem. The creator, dependent upon his creation, lives a simple life as a carpenter, knows mundane work, rejected by his family, rejected by his hometown Nazareth, rejected by the religious community, rejected by the nation of Israel. His desire to save, to seek and to save, took him to the cross where he's humbled in taking on human flesh, humbled as a servant, but ultimately humbled at the cross, despised, rejected, mocked, spit upon, took my sin, your sin upon himself so that we could be forgiven. 
This is so important to Christ that to fulfill this promise to seek and save the lost, it means that he went to the cross. And as we look through the gospels, we see this is what Jesus was doing. He came to seek and save Simon Peter. He came to seek and save Mary Magdalene, who was possessed with nine demons. Jesus gave life to the demoniac who was demon-possessed. It's just story after story of Jesus seeking and saving. And guess what? Jesus hasn't changed. And as you're thinking about a relationship with Christ, Jesus is seeking you for the purpose of saving you. I like this quote from C.S. Lewis. It says, You follow close behind the fugitive and call us to yourself in ways that we can't understand. (laughs) You follow close behind the fugitive and call us to yourself in ways we can't understand. Christ is knocking upon the door of your life. Think about that for a moment. The creator of the universe died for your sins and is seeking you personally for you to have a relationship with Jesus. He allows us to experience the emptiness of everything outside of him. If you know Christ as your savior, You can think back to that time when God was leading you to himself, how he was allowing you to come to dead ends so that you would turn to Jesus Christ. What was the story? Who were the people that he brought in your life? It was a loving God who was seeking and saving you. Now, as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ, we want to enter into Jesus' mission. Life is about knowing Jesus and making him known. To seek and to save means intentionality. Have you ever had something that's so valuable to you that you've lost, that you've sought it out? I gotta find those keys. I gotta find my wallet. I gotta find my phone. Can't do a lot of things without my phone. And so for us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus means to be intentional to seek out those who don't know Christ as their savior. Jesus was intentional with Zacchaeus. He saw him. He invited himself over to to his house. Now hear me out on this because I think we're living in really interesting times as as believers and there's so many things that are taking place in, in culture. And I've really been wrestling, wrestling individually and wrestling as as a pastor. And I do think that We have to get involved in the public square. We've got to get involved in in politics. Biblical issues are being decided. So so we as believers need to steward the freedom that we've been given uh, to vote. But if we as the church lose the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, if we lose the heart to go out to those that don't know Jesus and pursue them the way that Jesus has lost us. Church, we've lost everything. And politics is secondary to this mission of seeing people come to know Christ as their savior. Because that's what Christ is all about. That's what he is all about. So yes, we've, we've got to engage culturally. There's real things that are happening and God has called us to be salt and light. But as we engage, we can't do it in an angry tone that doesn't reflect the gospel, that doesn't reflect the heart uh, of Jesus Christ. Even as we're engaging in the political realm, what's the hope and the purpose? That somebody who doesn't know Jesus would come to know Christ as their savior. Uh, That's hopefully the whole reason that we're, we're getting involved. And it's easy for us, it's easy for me to get up and share these things and for us to believe these things. And it's another thing to wake up Monday morning and say, Jesus, I want to be on mission for what's close to your heart. I want to intentionally pursue those that don't know Christ their Savior. I want to reach out to the Zacchaeuses. Hopefully God's putting one unbeliever on your heart. Is there one unbeliever on your heart that you can pray for, that you can reach out to, that you can apply this message and text them today. How are you doing? Hey, let's let's spend some time together. So important to spend time together as believers, but we gotta spend time with unbelievers because Jesus seeks and saves the lost. Then to be open to that divine appointment, that Zacchaeus where 
They're not in my life. They're not a family member. They're not a friend. They're not a coworker. But God has given me an opportunity to love on them, to share Christ with them. And as we approach people, let's do it in the same manner as Christ and try to come in the fullness of grace and truth. Grace coming first. And as we come in grace, then we share truth. Never backing away from truth. If you've come to RMC for some time, you know we're committed to truth. Man, the truth of God is is what saves. We're not going to compromise truth, but we're approaching people in grace, which gives us the opportunity to be able to share truth. Man, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, don't we? We cannot do this on our own. This is, Lord, would you fill me to allow my life to, to be a witness But God really is moving in the hearts of people that don't know Christ as their Savior. There's so much confusion. There's so much darkness. And God wants to grab people and rescue them out of darkness into light. What happened with Zacchaeus from this point forward? I'm just curious. This is not the ending point. This is just the beginning point. I picture Zacchaeus just being this powerful testimony of Christ in Jericho where he maybe continued as a tax collector and was doing it in integrity. What, you're not going to rip me off? Jesus does die on the cross and rise again. And here's Zacchaeus saying, you got to know Jesus. You got to understand what Christ has done. I mean, what a testimony of this outcast, the chief tax collector coming to know Christ as their savior. Well, we've got a lot of work to do. Like I got to finish quite a few more verses and I feel like, I just got a little too worked up there, so you you guys might be here till 11, but now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. He's coming into Jerusalem and the mindset is that this is it. The kingdom of God is going to come on earth right now. There's a lot of anticipation about Christ. Next week when we study the triumphal entry, they had gotten palm branches because they believe that Christ is the Messiah and he's going to usher in the kingdom, which means the defeat of the, the Roman Empire. Palm trees don't grow in Jerusalem. They grow in Jericho. So they cut the branches in Jericho and brought them up to Jerusalem. And Jesus knows this crowd is thinking the kingdom of God's going to come physically on the earth right now, so he speaks this parable to them. This parable is different than the parable of talents. The parable of talents, individuals get different amounts. One talent, three talents, five talents. Here, there's 10 servants, and they're all given the same amount. So this is actually a different parable than the parable of talents. Verse 12, therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. So he's going to a far country to receive a kingdom and return. Jesus is going to ascend to be with the Father and then is going to return. His second coming, bring the physical reality of the kingdom of God. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. One mina is roughly three months of salary. So if you receive 10 minas, you get 30 months of salary. Think of your yearly salary. If you got 30 months of of salary, two and a half years of of salary, that's a big chunk of money that's handed to these 10 uh, servants with this instruction of do business till I come. Do business till I I come back. And that's the encouragement that Jesus gives to us as we wait for his second coming. As we wait for Jesus to rule and reign from Jerusalem is occupy till he comes. Be faithful till he comes. Do business till he comes. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. This speaks of the rejection from the Pharisees, the rejection from the nation of Israel, Christ being rejected. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he'd given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So the money didn't belong to them. 
the job was to be faithful with the money and hopefully make some gains so that when the master returns, the, the master had made more money. So they have to give an account. Each servant comes, I gave you 10 minas, how did you do by trading? For us as believers, we will give an account for our lives. It's not a question of whether we're saved or not. We're saved by grace through faith, but it is a question of faithfulness. It's a question of reward. Paul writes that our life will pass through a fire and the things that were done for the Lord will remain as precious gems. What's done of ourselves will will be burned up. We're going to suffer loss. We're going to have regret and go, I, I regret those selfish decisions when I wasn't living for the Lord, but there's going to be those, that time as believers that we're standing before him, what we're giving account of for our lives. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, having authority over 10 cities. The first servant says, hey, there was 10 more minas that took place from your investment. I'm now giving you authority in this kingdom, this kingdom that has come to reign over 10 cities. Why does faithfulness matter now? Because it's going to affect the eternal reward and responsibility. I don't fully understand how that's going to work, but it was important to Christ. It's something that he instructed us with, lay up treasures in heaven. And the faithfulness right now It's going to impact the reward that you receive and the responsibility that you are given. Be faithful with what is little. Do you ever get to that place where you're just tired, get weary? We have this encouragement in the New Testament in a couple of places. Don't get weary in doing good because the reward's coming in in due season. Maybe this morning you just find yourself, you're like, "I'm, I'm tired out. I'm wore out. I'm tired of going to work, working under the Lord, it not being seen, not receiving promotion, as someone that doesn't have near a strong work ethic, they're getting promoted. Hey, don't give up. Your service is under the Lord. The reward's coming. Jesus returns with his reward. And in that moment of standing before Christ, for Christ to say, you were faithful in that job. Here's the reward that I'm going to give to you in the kingdom. As a parent, maybe you're at a place where you're like, this is futile. The kids aren't grateful. They don't thank me for the meals. Don't thank me for doing their laundry. Don't thank me for changing their diaper. All these things, right? Teenagers do not understand the cost of utilities. Like, I'm just tired of it. I'm not going to serve them. I'm weary. Lift your eyes a little higher. You're not serving your kids, you're serving the Lord. Keep being faithful to them. Maybe you're at a place where God's given you opportunities to serve in the body of Christ and you're like, I'm just tired. I've I've been down this road too many times before and I love Jesus, but I'm not really interested in plugging in the body of Christ or or serving the body of Christ. Maybe you're even thinking about, hey, I'm, I'm stepping back from children's ministry and it may be time to do that. Or I'm stepping back from men's ministry or whatever the case may be. But it's also worth praying through, am I weary? And does the Lord want me to to continue? The the reward's coming. This life is short. At some point, it's going to be done. My life's going to be done. But also Christ is going to return and he returns with his reward. And the second came saying, Master, your your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. So I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? This third servant gets afraid and in fear says, I'm just going to hide this mina in a handkerchief. 
The master returns, says, here it is. I, I did nothing with this, this mina. And Jesus responds and he says, hey, you're, you're a wicked servant. Why didn't you at least put it in the bank and earn interest? And this may have revealed deeper things in this servant's heart. Why was he fearful of the master? He seems to have slavish fear instead of loving faith. We have fear of God, but it's not this slavish fear. It's not this, this fear that, that God's an austere man and he's just is waiting to, to judge me. God has the power to do that, but the fear of the Lord is realizing God's grace, his goodness, and saying, Lord, I don't want to do anything to hurt your heart. So this fear got the best of him, doesn't invest the mina, possibly didn't really believe that the master was going to uh, return. And Jesus says, you at least should have put it in the bank. I wonder what the master would have said if this servant would have said, you know, I was really afraid. I was really freaked out that I was going to lose this money. It's a big chunk of change, 30 months of salary. But I went ahead and invested it. It didn't go too well. And I lost it all. I wonder what the master would have said. Hey, I'm proud of you. You invested it. You took the risk. You didn't allow fear to, to get the best of you. You understood that I'm loving towards you. I don't know. But this particular servant was unfaithful because of his fear. In verse 24. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. But they said to him, Master, he has 10 minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So if you're responsible and faithful, guess what your blessing is? You get more responsibility. <laughs> the guy with 10 minas receives the one mina from the guy who was, was unfaithful. And the servants are like, wait a second, he's already got 10 minas. He doesn't need any more. But the master knew that he would be faithful with that. So if we're unfaithful with what God's given us, ultimately we're going to lose that. And if you're faithful in the little, then God will be able to entrust more. In verse 27, but bring here those enemies of mine, who do not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. This speaks of God's judgment that is tied in with his second coming. When Jesus returns in his second coming, he comes as the conquering king. It's described for us in the book of Revelation. And those that have rejected Christ, God's wrath coming upon a Christ-rejecting world. So for us this morning, what, what are the applications that God would have for our hearts. Well, well first, it's, it's be faithful. Jesus is coming back. Here we are 2,000 years later, and no doubt we're closer to the second coming of Christ. And it may happen in our lifetime, the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ. I think we're all voting for rapture. That would be a, a huge blessing. But it may not happen in our lifetime. And when we think about the second coming of Christ, it shouldn't be this attitude of, well, Jesus is coming, so I'm just going to get some more credit cards. And I'm going to rack up those credit cards. You know, I'm even going to quit my job because Christ is coming. What, what's, what's the big deal? No, understanding that Christ is coming, we go, I want to occupy until he comes. I want to be faithful. Lord, would you give me strength? Help me to not be weary in doing good. God is gracious. He allows U-turns. If we are at a place where like, man, I'm really not serving the Lord, today's the day. Today's the day to say, man, I, I want to be faithful unto the Lord. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want you to hear and see the way that Jesus loved Zacchaeus. And this is the way he loves you. He knows you. He sees you. He died for your sins. He rose again. And he's seeking you. This isn't a religion. He wants a personal relationship with you. And maybe you've heard a lot about Christ, but you've never trusted him as your savior. Maybe this is your first exposure to Jesus, but our sin separates us from Christ. The reason Jesus had to come and die a brutal death on the cross is because of my sin and your sin. Zacchaeus found something in Jesus that wealth could not provide. There was an emptiness in his life, apart from Christ, 
he found the bread of life. And up until this point, are you at a place of saying, I'm missing it. Relationships are just not enough. Possessions are not enough. This drug is is not enough. This alcohol is not enough. It's Jesus. Zacchaeus, there was a reason that Zacchaeus climbed that tree and it was this life that he was living was not enough and it wasn't satisfying. And as we sing in worship, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. To walk down right here in the front. Jesus is bold about his love for you. Be, Be bold about your willingness to receive Christ as your Savior and by coming to the front, it's, we're going to pray with you. People here are going to be excited for you. Not you joining a church, but you trusting Jesus, saying, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. For those online, we've got a team that's available to, to respond. If you go to the comments, I'd like to be saved. They're going to pray uh, with you. Today's the day of salvation. Jesus is coming to seek and to save those that are lost. And then as we think about application, in a sense, we want to read the Bible with our shoes on, our spiritual shoes on. We want to apply the things that we're learning and say, Jesus, I want to be about your business. I want to be about seeking and saving the lost. I want to love unbelievers and be intentional about it and send that text, make that phone call, pray, see who the Lord would have you reach out to. But God loves, loves people. And may we meet with the Holy Spirit where he gives us his love for people and a willingness to proclaim the gospel. The gospel is the best thing going. It's always been the best thing going. Jesus Christ and him crucified, that's the hope. That's the hope that changes hearts and minds and wins people to Christ. Let's stand together and let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you seek us, that you save us, that we're not just a number to you, but you know us by name. And Jesus, would you seek those this morning that haven't yet trusted you, that this would be the morning that they would see their need for you. We're so glad that they're, they're here. And Holy Spirit, would you do that work in your life? Father, we admit that we get distracted. I get distracted with all the, the challenges of life and even sometimes the joys of life and and lose sight of this mission to see people come to know Christ as their savior. We don't just want to read your word, but we want to be doers of your word. So would you fill us with your spirit? Give us a heart for the lost. Give us your love. Would help us to be able to truly approach people in the fullness of grace and truth. So we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 